Welcome to Saving Throws, the only podcast that implores you to slowly rotate a bullywug in your mind for free. My name's Harry, and I just spent 36 hours in the mines. My name's Ali, and I cast the faint familiar spell wrong, and I'm currently hiding in my office. My name's Kingsley, and I'm that rotating bullywug. Ha <laughs> ha! For um, free! For free! Uh, I'm fully free. <laughs> Um, and you know what else is free? Uh, Magic the Gathering Arena, if you're not playing Kaldheim, uh, and you haven't been for the past week, what it, what are you doing? Uh, also, stop listening, just, get on that. Go play. Just to, just to point out, another thing that's free is leaving a like, subscribe, uh, on our YouTube, Facebook, whatever you can, wherever you can find us, really helps us out, guys. Mm, oh, really you does. thought we would forget! Um, <laughs> yo, I've been, Every I've been... Time so deep into call time this week i've been playing more magic like this week than i have in the past maybe two years you finally oh, ascended so to my good. levels of playing magic and i'm so proud of you yeah <laughs> I, i've been playing magic to wake up um and honestly it works hey, it works it, work. it works it right work. it's fucked up it works i think it's because you get your brain going early man a couple of games i'm wide awake mm -hmm. i used to start my morning off with a can of monster or any energy i get my hands on and that's really not good for your heart so nope. i uh, one morning i didn't actually have any left in the house and i started a game of magic arena five games in. i was like whoa this has the same effect a little bit slower but the same effect. So that's now my morning ritual is wake up. I don't talk. I don't do anything. I get a drink of water and I just play five games of magic or six and I'm wide awake. It's a great little morning ritual. Mm. Have. Eat, sleep, Fortnite, repeat. I uh, okay. Fuck Fortnite. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> no, um, I, I love call time. My only complaint is that it's not a two set uh, like story because I just want to see more. I just want to see yeah, more. I know. It. Man, I did it way more like two years ago. I uh, I really want to. Uh, I really um cannot wait for the lore book on this because they always mm. bring a book out for every set, and it's never gonna happen because we did not see Karn in this set. But I would want to know what Karn's thinking, or I'd love to see Karn's reaction to find out there's a fire in the roaming about. <laughs> um, oh, his, I believe we did. Considering oh, his considering his curator Urza was the one that despised them so truly. Yeah. Um, um he's oh go I for remember Harry. we did talk about this at some point, maybe in a previous episode, or maybe I'm just fully going full total recall here. Um, but like uh I think we're gonna see maybe a Praetor in each of these upcoming sets. Mm. Like yeah. Jin Jin Gataxis in uh Strixhaven. Like masquerading as a teacher, Ooh. like like pretending to be a mage teacher, that would be sick. Um, well, bearing in bearing in mind, I wonder if Joda Joda Archmage Eternal. Oh, I also decide no, he is my five color commander. I love him so much. Get the uh, <laughs> goal loss people out of here. Joda is the best five color commander. Um, but he is he knew ours. He is the Archmage Eternal, the wizard that's lived for since the oh, since I, I exaggerating here since the start of time essentially. And I wonder if we'll see him in Strixhaven uh, finding out about the Phyrexians being back. I just want to point out, I'm not sure if it was in this podcast or the five, or the 10 minute conversations we have before we start recording, but do you guys remember when I had said, and I said it was either in a podcast, one of our previous podcasts, or it was right before we started recording, I said to you guys, Carl time with all the snow, can you imagine if it turned out there was a frozen Phyrexia in there? And what the yeah, fuck did we get? Here we are. What the fuck did we get? I said that as a throwaway, and I hope it was in a previous podcast, so the proof is there. But hopefully you guys can remember when we first talked about Carl time, I said, yo, how fucked up would it be if there was like a Phyrexia frozen in snow there since that plane's never been touched upon, but there was Carl time uh, warriors and Vikings in the older sets, and we actually got that. We actually mm. got a Phyrexian who was uh, who thought out on Kaltheim. I just want to yeah. say, going to like Karn and Karn figuring out there's a Phyrexian or in Kaltheim. Um, the the character icon that I play, uh, as you can see, watching the footage right now, uh, call forward to the future. Um, I play Karn and. My favorite card at the minute in call time is Vorinclex, the Phyrexian we're talking about. Um, yeah, Vorinclex, man, he is just, just so broken, Let me man. get some Vorinclex, love. I mean, mm. look, Trample, Haste, it's a six drop, six, six. And if you would put one or more counter on a permanent or player, put twice that many on each of those kind of counters on that permanent or player instead. Then oh, your opponent only gets half of the counters that they should get on their permanents or players. 
Uh, oh, they're bearing in mind if they if they if they have any chance, pride me out, gain one life, gain one counter, they get zero counters. Mm-hmm. Voren clicks. Uh, he's going to see a lot of play in Commander. Uh, he will see a lot of play in Standard, and, and people are listening. Go, he's talking about Commander again. Commander is the best format, not just my opinion. Look up the statistics. Literally, Commander is the fan favorite format, and there's a reason for that. But he will get plays in all the other formats, but in Commander, he is almost not almost. He is a win condition because he has Trample Haste a six six. Mm-hmm. Now. There's a lot you can do to sell for him, or nothing you can do, because if you get Vlorenclex out and then equip him with a grafted exoskeleton, he gets 1-1 one, one and has Infect, and does it matter if your life's a million in magic, you get 10 Infect counters, you out, you just die. So, you get Vlorenclex out, give him a grafted exoskeleton, double the counters, and if they either block, chum block or something crappy, you have Trample, if they don't block, his first attack is lethal. That is someone out because they're going to get 12 uh, they're going to get 12 in- infect counters or even pair of Vorinclex or Blightsteel Colossus. He's in 11 11 with infect and he has trample. With him on the board, literally Vorinclex is a win condition no matter where you put him if you're, if you're running dude, infect. Dude, what I've got right now going is I've got Elvish Warmaster uh, and then I've got um, oh god, it's not Harold. Um, it is Tyvar. Tyvar Kel, the new Planeswalker. Um, Elvish Warmaster, stick four of those in your deck. That's basically, it's a two drop for a two two, but whenever one or more elves enter the battlefield under your control, you create a one one elf creature token. Um, then for seven mana, two of those being green, all elves you can c- control get plus two, plus two, and gain death touch. Um, there is another elf card. Sorry, there is another. Yeah, there's a human card that gives all of your creatures with death touch poison counters. If you pay that up with Tyvar, Elvish Warmaster, um, Vorinclex, and um, there is a card in the meta right now. Um, my brain is going slow. Um, Arachna, Arachnophobia, not Arachnophobia, um, something like that. It's a two drop that gives you, it makes your creature a creature of every type. So if you use that, that makes Vorinclex an elf. That means he gets all the buffs from Tyvar, all the buffs from Elvish Warmaster, and then he's got Death Touch as well on top of that. All you need are 10 counters, um, 10 poison counters uh, for a win. Poison? I think po- poison and infect are different. Poison no, no, I'm sorry. I'm talking about uh, poison at the minute. Oh, okay. I mean, um, so poison and infect are different things. Yeah. I need to get yes. all the proper cards. Um to think of but it's it's a good combo it's a lengthy one it takes a little while but green's all about that slow ramp baby so it deals it deals damage in the form of poison counters Mm -hmm. poison and infect are separate mechanics yeah Yeah. but they both get to the same place i think i'm not quite sure yeah Um, they're they're different things but they are they are more or less two sides of the same coin Mm -hmm. Uh, we're going to void a role for our first topic listeners if you have got if you haven't gathered that and we're going to talk about Call Time. Call Time just came out on Arena. It comes out. Oh, it comes out I- IRL on Valentine's Day. I think. Nice. I think it's the fifth. Um, oh no, it's the sixth. I think it's the sixth. Sorry, the sixth. You um, where? How did your brain do that thing? Valentine's Day is the fourteenth. <laughs> Oh, Dang. oh, sorry. So I'll explain why I meant to be doing a draft of Kill Time on Valentine's Day. That's why. Oh, <laughs> fair. Love That's that. where um, my brain went. That sorry. That is where my crackhead brain went. Um, but my yeah, crackhead uh, brain. For just any of our listeners that don't play Arena, is actually not surprised about the community. Magic community does not play Arena, and uh, they always get the card sets. Well, certain card sets. They don't get things like Commander Legends and stuff, or Double Masters, or Jumpstart. Um, but the arena always gets them two weeks early and it's great to get mm. in and play them and then for me personally it's good to get in and play them and see what cards I want to look for myself to draft as commanders or to put in the 99 of a commander deck I love getting it it, was, it worked, worked out great for Zendikar because by the time the Zendikar actually came out IRL I knew what I wanted and I started my decks off straight away and it's a, and mm. it's a good thing to see what you're looking for and also it also means that you get to see the set you know apart from the leaks that come out you get to see the whole set and if it's not something you're interested in, you don't lose money uh, pre-ordering a booster box. Say you pre-order a booster box and you hate all the cards in it, let's say you jump onto an arena that's free, you can see what cards are there, and if you're not interested in the set, you don't have to gamble your money buying a booster box. Yeah. Absolutely. Um, it was, sorry, it was a Rackno form I was talking about. Um, mm. And I'm just, I'm just looking, I fully have loaded up arena. Uh, this is something we don't do when we're uh, recording this podcast. Um, 
but I've loaded up Arena just because we're talking about Call Time, and I just want to talk to you about the fucking great cards that are in this set. Um, oh, so good. Arachnoform, and then mixing that up with, um, obviously giving that to your Vorniclex, so he's now an elf, mixing him in with, with Tyvar. Just, it's so easy to create a green-black elf deck, um, and it's so hard not to slip into that. Uh, my I mean, past- it's, 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 it's just crazy, because I touched on it, I think, actually, I think I touched on it on our live stream uh, PSA. We live stream every Thursday, 6 p.m. Eastern, as Saving Throws Happy Hour. We get drunk and either play some magic, or we just sit and play some other games and have a laugh. Come join us this Thursday. Uh, tangent off again, um, it is crazy, because with Commander Legends, that was the last set we got, sorry, not like the last court, the last, the last big set was Zendikar, but the last like most recent magic set was commander legends we got a shit ton of black and green elves in that set like mm-hmm. a lot uh, i just finished my mono green commander elf deck and then i got a um, lana war monstrosity it's uh like yeah. a four drop zero zero but i guess plus one plus one for every elf on the battlefield or graveyard uh, it's black green and they brought in a lot of great black uh, elf cards and with this set now there i think we're gonna see a new uh, a new version of black uh, uh, black sorry elf tribal where it's gonna move from mono mm. green or selesnia it's going to be ogari because some of the black elves in this set are ridiculous and if you pair them with some of the elves in commander legends you're going to have a phenomenal deck yeah. in your hands. Um, absolutely death knell berserker to name one death knell berserker is great because if you can give it one counter you can risk that straight away um obviously it stops being an elf but you get a 2-2 black zombie um there's another card elder fang disciple no it's not elder fang disciple um, it's Elder Fang opportun- Elder Fang Ritualist. Um, when Elder Fang Ritualist dies, you return another elf card from your graveyard to your hand. Um, so useful in a black green in a black green elf tribal deck. Um, going outside of the tribal though, Finn the Fang Bearer is the card I was talking about, and it is a one. Uh, it, sorry, it's a two drop with Death Touch. Um, and whenever you, a creature you control with Death Touch deals combat damage to a player, that player gets two poison counters um combo that again with your um with your elven war master um and if you've got elven ambush in your deck elven ambush gives you a one counter for every elf you have out tap your elven war master swing for lethal um and then you can easily get 10 poison counters like that's just five attacks I mean, like, I, I want to get a Vornicles for a, a Vornicles, sorry, for my, a, my, my elf, my elf deck, IRL, I, my elf the commander deck a, is, is a Marlene, and her ability is, she's a three drop for a 1-1, one, one, but anytime an elf ATBs on your side of the battlefield, a, you get a 1-1, one, one, she gets a 1-1 one, one counter, and with Vornicles, this is going to pop off so quickly, I, I'm running two decks with this kind of synergy, one Simic, and one is this Simic is great for putting counters on things. It's one mm-hmm. of the best cards to do so. Uh, and it runs in the mono green. And uh, it, it pairs great with Yorvo, Lord of Garenbrig, because he's a three. He's a zero zero, but he ETBs a four one one counters. And if another green creature enters back under your control, put a one one counter on your vote. Then if that could just power is greater than your vote, put another one one counter on. With Vorniclex, he is popping with a mono green deck. Oh yeah. He is building, 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 and it's fucking tasty. I mean you you saw when we played uh I think we played Oh no, it was it was during our live stream. It was during our uh, live stream. I played Vorinclex uh with because we were playing friendly brawl, I got to play a historic Hydra. Um, and I managed on, on, I think it was maybe turn five or something. I had a 42, 43 Hydra out on the field. Yeah, with Trample. Did yeah. not, was mm-hmm. not fun. Oh, my uh, I, I have been, chef. this morning, I got an amazing combo of, I've, I've only got Vornicle, Vorniclex out once, <laughs> but luckily my, I, I don't, uh, cause it, cause you can't really play Brawl on Arena or Commander. You can play Brawl your friends, but you don't really get XP for it playing against random. So I was playing Historic right now and I got my, uh, Vorniclex out had my, uh, I can't remember what it's called, I think it's Hybosis Hydra, it's the Simic Hydra that it enters with X11 counters, it has Flying and Trample, and it also you gain half of X life and draw that many cards. I had him on the board with uh, Hydra Growth, and then had, I think it's called uh, Insurgent Growth, or Hydra Growth, it gives a, one, a quick creature gets 1-1, one, one, and every upkeep, double amount of counters on it, which is great, because it comes in with X counters, so it's doubling straight away my next upkeep, and then 
I think it's called Insurgent Growth. I can't remember what it's called. It's an instant that puts a 1 1 counter on target creature, then double those counters. I swung at a person for 200 200 damage when then my next turn because it just escalated so quickly with Vorinclex out. And truly, truly incredible. Insane. Harry, what are you playing uh, in Kaldheim right now? I mean, okay, so the thing that I really love about Kaldheim is it's a set where there's just so much going on, you know? Mm. There's like tribal, there's snow, there's like boast. There's like a really heavy boast aggro deck that I really like. Um, there's a lot of like, a lot of really like persnickety archetypes that like I really, really mm. want to delve into. I've been seeing a lot of um, like spells that care about the second spell that you cast yeah. in a turn, which is like, I really, really want to put together like a red, red, black, maybe red, green, black, like Jund um super aggro hyper spell slinger bernie kind of deck but like so i still have to sounds like you yeah, yeah big sounds like big mate. burn deck mm. what a surprise yeah. yeah um there i i love snow i've been waiting for snow to come back for years and it's finally back and i love it i love it so much yeah, um, I, mean, I mean, they kind of brought Snow back on Modern Horizons, but they didn't really do it justice. This set, they mm. really went balls to the wall with the whole Snow permanence. Yeah, I, I mean, when I when I say I've been waiting for Snow to come back, I mean, I've been waiting for new Snow cards to get printed, and I'm waiting, I've been waiting for a new place where the Snow has become, like, thematically relevant to, like, the setting. Because um, I just, I would like to see a snowy place. I love snow. Um, <laughs> but no, there's so much going on in Kaldheim. It's like a truly massive set. There's so much tribal. There's so much tribal support. What with the, like the changelings as well. Like you can you can use changeling to fill in the gaps. Actually, I with love you saying that, should we all maybe say four or five of our favorite cards if we Easy. have that many? Done. Easy. All right. Done. Should we roll initiative? <laughs> see who goes first. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Sure. Sweet. Go ahead. Let's roll initiative then. Fuck it. Uh, do you want to roll it. for you guys or should we all roll individually? Oh, I've got I'll, a dice right here. I'll roll right here. Uh, are we adding our real life initiative modifier? Uh, so, so, so we're all, so we're all <laughs> doing minus five then? I fully uh, was yeah. about to say minus five, yeah. Um, well, <laughs> for me, I got a nice clean 11. Okay, if we're doing, if we're really doing minus five, I, I got, got a, a two. one. <laughs> no, 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 we're doing, we're doing, we're doing a straight roll. Okay, straight roll. I, got, I got a six. I and got what did two. you get, Harry? Oh, oh wow! Damn. I thought I thought I was losing with eleven, but it turns out eleven. Man, if we were, if we were a real party, we'd be fucked IRL. Not twenty. Oh, not God. twenty. Right now, watch this. And it rolled off. Could have been great. I will roll um, again and see what I get. A seventeen. So I've only solidified that. Okay. So going first, and we're gonna uh, we, should, we should have we should have like a swear jar. I've got a donate one dollar, but we're talking about, talk about commander. Mm -hmm. I'm looking at this just to put this clear to our listeners and to you guys. You guys talk about it as much as you want, but I'm looking at this strictly from a commander player because me and my play group we don't play standard. We only play commander. So first one is probably gonna be the first guy I talk about is probably gonna be the first deck I build around because when I read this on Arena I got so many ideas that's going to be Orva the All Form he is 1 blue and 3 generic and he's a changeling and he's a 3-3 three, three, and whenever you cast an instant or sorcery spell if it targets 1 or more other permanents you control create a token as a copy of those permanents now it does not say non-land so I can double up land oh. I can clone creatures I can just pop off so quick with this commander. Also, when a spell or ability an opponent controls causes you to discard this card, create a, to create, a co create a token that's a copy of target permanent. Now, let me just say how we can now, let's go into it quickly before I talk about other cards, how we can manipulate this very easy. So, one of the best, I, in my personal opinions, one of the best cards in Commander to run, or maybe just in any form of uh, magic, is Mirage Mirror. It's an artifact that costs three, and you can pay two to make Mirage Mirror until the end of the turn become a copy of any target permanent on the board. So, you run Mirage Mirror, you target it with any spell. So, say for example... Yeah, we'll just go Vorniclex, for example. Kingsley plays Vorniclex. I can't have him in my deck. My deck can't run blue if it's commander. I use Mirage Mirror, make a copy of Vorniclex, target my Mirage Mirror with anything. It will copy what the Mirage Mirror is. Then when my turn ends, Mirage Mirror goes back to normal, but now I've got a permanent copy of someone else's card. And you can keep doing that because you can pair over, uh, over with Mirage Mirror. Go around the board, make Mirage Mirror different things. Uh, that you want to have, then target it with a spell of Orvars on the board, copy that so when Mirage Mirror reverts, it doesn't matter because you've got the copy of that card already. He will literally let you copy 
crappy cards and the deck that I'm going to build around this is anything you can do, I can do better. And that is the plan I have for that commander deck. One of my next favorite cards, I have to say, is Tigrid. Uh, she is a flip. She's one of the legend she's one of the new gods out. I'm not going to talk about her artifact form, even though there is ways to go infinite and break the game with her artifact form. You know what? I'll talk about the artifact form as well. But uh, Tigrid is two black, three generic. She has menace and is four five. Whenever an opponent sacrifices a non-token permanent or discards a permanent card, you may put that card from the graveyard onto the battlefield under your control. It's in black. You are not going to have, you are going to have so many ways to make your opponent discard and sacrifice. That's pretty much all what black does. And I, I stay away from mono color decks in commander. I made a mono green deck because green is such a strong color. Um, I, I, I like mixing my colors up. She will definitely be in my first mono black commander deck because she is just insane. Even if you, even if you look at her flip ability and if you're a magic player, you'll know how to make this go infinite. So, or you can play her as a lantern, a legendary artifact for four, one black, three generic. Tap. Target player loses three life unless they sacrifice a non-land permit or discard a card. Pay four. Untap it. There are so many ways to go infinite with that and just instantly steal the game from under someone right there. But mm. uh, I'll be playing her for her main card ability. Uh, my next personal favourite uh, uh, is Vorniclex, and I'm not going to go into my video read him, just Vorniclex is just, he is going to be amazing in Simic, he is going to be amazing in Infect, wherever you want to put him, he is going to do whatever you want if you're building round counters. Vorniclex has got so many uses, just round has a one ability that he is going to be a great card to run in most decks. Um, I personally love Vargoth, Blood Sky Sire. He is one black, two generic. He's a two, three with death touch. He has boast. So you pay one black, one generic. Target player searches a library for a card. Then shuffles a library and puts that card on top of it. Uh, and the boast thing is means you can only activate the ability if you've attacked this turn. But that's a command. He's a legendary creature. So he's a commander. So that is infinite tutors. As long as he stays on the board, you're always tutoring. You never now have to worry about top decking because you just have to make an attack, boast, and no matter what, you're putting that card on top of your deck. He's also a great politicking card. Say you have a board wipe and say there's four or five at the table and someone's board's getting really out of control. I could say, hey, Harry, Kicking's getting out of control. Do you, do you know if you have something to deal with this? And Harry could be like, well, in my deck, not in my hand, I could go, well, if you let me hit you for two damage, I will let you fetch that card so your next turn you draw it. He's just, he's just, he's great for political and just infinite chores. Dude, there's, um, there's a card right now in call time called Realm Walker. It's a three drop green card. Uh, it's a changeling. But pair him up with this. Um, Realm Walker... You may look at the top card of your library at any time and you can cast creature spells of the chosen type from the top of your library. So say you're playing elf tribal. tribal. Yeah, dragon tribal, anything yeah, really. Any tribal, the realm walker enters the battlefield, choose a creature type, and then if the creature type on the top of your deck is the same as realm walker, then you can just play those cards from the top of your library. I'm just thinking like, you don't even have to wait to draw. Um, you can just she shuffle. Will definitely, she yeah. will be going into my Elf Treble deck and she will be going into my five color Commander Dragon deck. Uh, I'm, uh, I'm getting phenomenal. a Varagoth in right now. <laughs> Uh, Realm Walker is great. Yeah. Uh, I will just do one more because I don't want to take all the cards. I could talk about Call Time, my favorites all day. Uh, there is a few I'm actually stuck between, but I have a feeling that some of the boys here um, may uh, talk about them. So I'm going to go with what I don't think they will talk about. Uh, and really, Doomscar almost made this uh, list. But if we uh, if no one talks about Doomscar, I will. It's uh, just a board wipe, but a very cheap one. Uh, but I personally love... Uh, in Search of Greatness. This is an enchantment that costs two. The art is just beautiful. It's got a big bad wolf with the northern lights behind it. And I can't remember the name of the card. I think it's like Tarvar or something. It's the, it's the brand new squirrel commander that came out. Oh, I um, love him. I love but, him. Uh, it's uh, an enchantment. Yeah. It's, it's a two drop enchantment. And it reads, At the beginning of your upkeep, you may cast a permanent spell from your hand with, with converted mana cost equal to one plus the highest converted mana cost from other permanents you control without paying its mana cost. If you don't, 
scry one. So if you don't, you're scrying one. This is mono green, or you can run this in any green color combination out there, but green does something great, and that's play, and that is play big dumb monsters. So, for example, we're just going to use uh, our boy of the hour here. Once uh, we have a few new editing skills, we can uh, have some nice photoshopped of uh, Vorniclex with like a little uh, king crown on, but uh, say you have Vorniclex out, Okay, so now from your hand, you can pay anything that's seven or less. That is pretty, that, and that's once a turn you're doing that. That's great. That is so fucking good. Because if you run Eldrazi in your deck, you start getting them out, then you're just going to overrun, honestly. Like, that two drop enchantment is great because one plus the highest mana. So by turn two, you're easily going, well, maybe, maybe if the magic gods have been unforgiving to you, you're easily going to have a Lana War Elf out, a one drop or a two drop. So that means, okay, now you can play a three drop for free and then you still have your mana to use. Next turn, you can get a five or six drop out. Still got your mana to use. This card feeds itself. It That's the thing the I love ramp. about it. It, it does. straight up it feeds itself. So you can you can literally go look. I've got a Lana War Elf out. I have nothing for two drop. I've got another Lana War Elf out. So I'll play that. And someone's like, "Oh, well, you're using you pay two. You play the two drop enchantment to get two one ones out." Yeah, that's fine. By turn four, you're like, now here's my 10-10 because yeah. it's in green so you can ramp the mana and you get one free summon and then you still have your mana unused. Like this card, not only does it feed itself, it lets you manipulate and sculpt and just form your field the way you want it to be. And I, and I love the, from the fact that the name of it is In Search of Greatness. Uh, is I that, that is going to be going in any of my decks that run green. I love that card. But that's uh, that's my cards. Uh, I like I said, there was more to talk about, and I, I guess we can do a quick rundown at the end. I just want to take anything from the guys here. Uh, so I'm now going to pass it on to Harold. Uh, uh, Kingsley, actually, it's actually me. But funnily oh, Kingsley, enough, sorry, sorry. Funnily you enough, be such bad initiative. <laughs> I will talk about Harold. Uh, I, like I said, I've been playing a lot of Elf. Uh, been playing. It's str honestly Welcome. exclusively Welcome, elf. Um, elf and shapeshifters and changelings, all amazing in this set. Like Harry said, uh, Harry, like Ali said, in search of greatness is amazing. We're basically the same guy. Uh, yeah, <laughs> we're all the same person. Um, <laughs> in search of greatness is amazing. A great uh, two drop enchantment. And then when you're playing green elf, uh, green black elf decks, uh, binding the old gods. I just want to say right now, I love all of the sagas. Um, I hate them as much as I love them because I hate playing against them. Um, but binding the old <laughs> gods is a four drop. It costs uh, obviously two swamp, one forest, um, and then two of any color. Uh, number one, destroy target non-land permanent and opponent controls immediately. That's great. That that, um, that is great. That that's a, that that that, re that recalls the saga that came with Thoros, say uh, Elspeth's nightmare. Yeah, uh, the turn one destroy as well. Um, then second, search your library for a forest card, put it onto the battlefield tap, then shuffle your library. Um, you still get to play another land, so that's two land in a turn. Um, number three, creatures you control gain death touch until end of turn. If you're pairing that um, with our boy that I've already forgotten the name of because I hate myself, apparently, um, the Fang, um, you can immediately swing. And also, it's a massive, like... Imagine you're playing against a, a big green deck and they're all just like 1-1 one, one counters and you're like, okay, cool, fine, this isn't scary at all. Then you swing with full death touch, terrifying. Uh, so you either take all of those death touch counters or you kill all your creatures. It's an easy, cheesy board wipe. I mean, um, I mean, I, we're forgetting the thing as well. It's in Golgari colors and you can easily get insect tokens, rat, whatever mm -hmm. you want. The tokens are there. And if you don't want to bulldoze your creatures, yeah, you can kill all your opponents but lose all your creatures. You can, that means all your shitty little 1-1 one, one tokens are death touchers as yeah. well. But then my second favorite card uh, is Harold Unites the Elves. Well done, Harry. I just want to say what a momentous um, thank you, thank job you. that thank was. You. And you're doing really well, actually, um, as the new King of the Elves. I think mm, you've done great you. so far. Um, yeah. This one is mill three cards. You put an Elf uh, or Tyvar card from your graveyard onto the battlefield. You don't have to pay for it. It just goes on. Um, second step, 
put a plus one plus one counter on each elf you control. Oh, if you've I got Vorinclex, so if you've got Vorinclex and a Rachno form on top of your Vorinclex, that's easily a plus two plus two for each elf you control. Um, mm. Third one, whenever an elf you control attacks this turn, target creature an opponent controls gains minus one minus one until end of turn. You can easily, if you've got a, a full stack of elves out, um, you can easily destroy a creature just by attacking. Um, I have a question for you, Kingsley. I have an you acquired the actual Harold card yet? I do have Harold. Uh, yeah, I've I was going to say because that could be your commander yeah. for our Friday Night Fight. Well, I I run so I run King Harold's Revenge, which is amazing. Uh, each creature gets plus one plus one for each creature. Sorry, not each creature. One creature gets plus one plus one for each creature you control and gains trample, and it must be blocked this turn. Um, then you've got Harold himself. Uh, again, Harry. Great job. Uh, Thanks, man. Who has Menace. Um, then when he enters, when he ETBs, you look at the top five cards of your library and you can reveal an elf warrior, an elf, a warrior, or Tyvar from among them and put it into your hand. Put the rest into your uh, into the bottom of your library in a random order. And then once you get that Tarvar out, you're just... Oh, like, there's so much synergy here. Yeah. And again... You know we're all lore whores here. I want to hear the lore behind Harold. Yes, so do I. Uh, Harold King of Skimfar, if I'm saying that right. Uh, because if you look at his art, he looks like a... He used to be like a somewhat happy guy, green card, but he's now spliced into black. And uh, I might be I might be getting this wrong, but I don't think I've ever seen Harold before. Um, so I want to I want to hear about this guy's journey here, about his characteristics, because he looks really interesting to me. The card art is beautiful, and he is going to be great. And I'm really considering either having him in the 99 of the black uh, of the Golgari elf deck I'm making at IRL, or having him as the commander because he is just they've really done like I didn't think. Elf could get better and they really made them great yeah. set. um speaking of which this is one of my favorite cards um my third favorite card uh in no specific order elven bow one drop mm. green card right when elven bow enters the battlefield you may pay two mana of any color if you do create a one one green elf warrior creature token then attach the elven bow to it the equipped creature gets plus one plus two and has reach so for three mana You've got an uh, an artifact that just comes out. Instead of paying three to equip it, if you have no creatures on the field, you just pay two. So you pay the full equip cost, and then you've got a, a two oh, three th elf this warrior. This is like uh, this is like the Draugar helm for black. Mm -hmm. Exactly, yeah. Mm. Um, Elven bow, so cool. And then my final one is obviously going to be uh, Elven Warmaster because just the just the ability to just tap a bunch of mana and make it so every single elf you has has death touch uh, every creature you have has death touch that's sick that's insanely mm. cool well, and elf death though, touch that, 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 that's yourself. a pump that's a pump which means if you're in green you've got lots of mana you pair that with a paradox engine yes it was banned the commander but some players groups don't play with band limits and this also could be standard or historic you play this in you pair that with a paradox engine you're casting spells if you if you have that seven mana with your mana rocks or, or elves elves usually tap for mana if yep. you want to get if literally even say for example you throw him as a two or throw anything through and your opponent's like oh it's too damage i'm going to chump block if you can pay that twice that's great. I'm, I'm not sure with your other enchantments and stuff. Pump abilities are great because you, I, I have lost to it and I have won to it in both Arena and IRL. Um, Danny, if you're listening, you love your last minute pump effects when someone goes, I'm not going to block that two damage. And you're like, well, now it's in a million, a million. You're like, whoa, yikes. Yeah, I um, love that. So that, that makes it even better. The fact that his, uh, his ability to make uh, give plus two, plus two in death touch is also a pump ability. I mean, yeah. I'd like to see it a little bit cheaper, but the fact he's giving death touch makes it fair, I think. Oh, it's a, it's a full game finisher if you play it right. Um, <laughs> one uh, honorable mention for Tyvar because I Tyvar is obviously if I'm playing elves, Tyvar is obviously my favorite card. But I, you know, I'll space that out. Um, like you were saying, all elves tap <laughs> for mana. Uh, all elves tap for mana. That's true, and even truer now because. Tyvar gives you the ability that all elves you control, every single one, you can tap it to add black mana. 
Oh wow, that's great because it'll so, usually just tap for green. So if you're using exactly. like a Gari color deck, that's feeding itself, man. Exactly. That's fucking great. It, it's and there's so, so many easy ways to ramp with elves, man. Elves can make tokens of themselves. I mean, Imperius, perfect. You tap or pay two, you get another elf out. And, there's, and uh, I can't remember what the, the elf card is, but all your elves have. Uh, I think it's. Oh, I can't remember. I think it's like I think it's. Uh, uh, Elven Archmage. Uh, all the other elves get 1 1. You can tap him and add green mana for each elf you control. And there's another elf card that all your elves can tap for 1 green mana. With Tarvar, you can tap for black mana. You're just, oh, you're going to have so much mana, you don't know what to do, know what to do with it. Yeah. When you get Eska's, Eska, Eska's chariot out as well, um, anytime you attack with that chariot, you can create a, a copy of any target token. So you can just be creating uh, elves out the wazoo. Um, but that's enough of my favorite cards. I'm very clearly an elf head uh, for this set. <laughs> Harry, hey, welcome to the yeah. club, man. I'm glad to hear it. <laughs> Harry, take <laughs> me away. So I've got a bunch of eclectic ones. Um, we're going very crunchy with the reason we like cards. Today, I'm just going to be real fluffy, real soft, real sweet. Going in for the flavorful. Um, mm, one of my favorite cards that I've been trying to play with and tinker around. Uh, it's like Car Door. Car Door. Car, I don't know. Car Door. <laughs> car Door. Okay, Car Door. Is, 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 is this Car Door Go Doom Scourge? Doom Scourge, yeah. So he enters yeah. the battlefield uh, and th until your next turn, um, creatures that your opponents control have to attack each combat if a if able, and they have to attack a player other than me, basically. Now, or do you. you know what that wording is? That is goading. But why is it not called goading? Because wizards are, do not want goading in standard. So they printed a card that has goad without the word goading on it. Yeah, <laughs> I guess I guess they did. They literally um, did, also, yeah. But also, whenever a tagging creature dies, each opponent loses one life, and I gain one life. So it's it is truly. I just love it for the flavor of having a big giant demon berserker on your side who's just flipping everybody off, and it's just like go fucking attack, dude. And then it's just, it's just such a fun card. I have yet to build around it, so I don't quite know all of the amazing synergies that I could find with it. But it is truly a card that I I, I hold very special and near and dear to my heart because. In my darkest, darkest parts of my heart, I am a Rakdos player. Kingsley knows this. I know um, this. Um, I my, mean, that, my... that that card, maybe not so good in a one-on-one, -on -one, but that card's a game ender in multiplayer. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah, absolutely. I mean, in multiplayer. And, and he is definitely, if you look at his art, he's definitely a Minotaur, but uh, obviously a Demon Berserker, because probably good old Rakdos himself probably brought him back. But yeah, he is, it says <laughs> Demon, but he's a Minotaur. If you look at him, that dude's a Minotaur. Yeah, let me look at this fucking art. He's yeah, like he a definitely... he's he looks to me like a baby Godzilla. Um, yeah, true. But Godzilla's. obviously he is. Yeah, I see that Minotaur, like a demon Minotaur. He's a demon. Yeah, demon, demon Minotaur. And literally, there's so many ways to sugar that ETB again, man. Honestly, there's yeah, just, it's like, so many ways. I'm just loving these last couple sets, man, because, like, as a commander player, uh, again, take everyone to take a shot, Ali said commander, um, but we usually get slim pickings, and with these last couple standard sets, man, there's just been a plethora of good commanders. Yeah. Truly. Truly, though, they, 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 I think Wizards has started to realize that commander is probably one of the more popular formats, so they are designing for commander. And some people might say that that design philosophy... Um, sacrifices the overall health of standard for commander, but it also is very fun, and I love commander. I mean, um, that, that statement is even more true. We used to get one commander set a year. We used to get five decks at the start, of, like midway through the year, quarter two, and that was us. Last year, we got the four at the start, we got two with Zendikar, and we got two with... Um, I call it? A blank. Uh, no, no, no. We got two with Zendikar... Uh, and then we got two. Uh, I think with, uh, it wasn't Commander Eldrin, but uh, no, no, Eldrin was a couple years ago. But anyway, it doesn't matter. We got we got three Commander sets last year. We got the five decks at the start of the year. We got two decks in the midway point, and we got two decks again in November. And then we got Commander Legends. I think Wizard can see that themselves because we used, it used to be one Commander set a year. It was five decks every year. Well, four, then it moved to five. It's five decks. That was it for the year. But nope, last year we got a, a set of five decks, a set of two decks, and another set of two decks. And we're getting another set of two decks with uh, when Caltim actually releases. There's going to be two commander decks coming out with Caltime. Uh, Pre-cons, that is. 
One is Simic and one is Golgari. One is all about boasting and one is Elf Golgari. Again, more Elves. It's a pre-con you can buy. Uh, one is all, one's a Ragnar something, a Simic colours. And it's all about uh, foretelling. Uh, I think his ability is the first card you foretell each turn costs zero to foretell, which is just amazing. Oh. And then the Elf deck is uh, Golgari uh, Elf Treble, I believe, because the commander is an Elf. Yeah, this is... Sorry, Harry, you fully got your card still to go through. I was about it's... to go off on something. No, Please you're good. Go you're it. totally fine. Uh, I mean, honestly, the cards I was going to talk about are not super splashy. It's literally just, I'm so happy that Snow is back in standard. Um, Frostbite, I've been waiting for a bolt again, and I'm finally happy that I got my snow-flavored bolt. Um, effective uh, burn and removal, incredible. Oh, is that the um, one I used on you? It said there's two damage, you control a snow, or X amount of snow pairs or something, you do three damage, is that it? Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah, it's um, pretty tasty. Uh, and then also Frozen Lanoir Elf, Sculptor of Winter. I mean, um, oh, yeah. comboing comboing that with like Glittering Frost, which oh. is like an enchantment that you can enchant any land, make it snow, uh, and then whenever it's tapped, you can make double mana. Um, you can you basically have a land that gets untapped twice um, by Lanoir Elves uh, for mana off of a single If you uh, guys land. want to see Harry uh, beat my ass with that mechanic, our live streams <laughs> are always posted directly to our YouTube afterwards. Our last Very one fun. ended a bit randomly because a computer crashed uh, towards the end of it. Yep, but and you didn't recover past, until uh, the next if, morning. If you, if you look at that past live stream, you will see Harry go off with just a bunch of uh, essentially uh, frostbitten uh, Llanowar elves, and he goes off, and by like turn four, he's got a billion things out because he's untapping his land, and he's got oh, steamrolled yeah. hardcore. <laughs> can I can I read you the flavor text to Frostbite, if I may? Yeah. Um, it says, <clears throat> don't wander far. It's a bit nippy out there. That's fine. But here's what gets me. The guy who said that is called Leader, and his job is Expedition Leader. I don't want to say anyone's getting lazy, but calling a Leader, mm. Leader, um, <laughs> truly, I don't know, man. Just, hey, it, man, it the me. people, the, the, let's remember, the staff at Wizards must be tired. We have never oh, gone I, to many sets. Like... Hasbro, I think it's phenomenal. <laughs> Hasbro must have brought in some new Taskmasters because Goblin we Taskmaster. have been drowning in sets the last the last year, and with this year seems to be the exact same. So I think they're like, read a name. I, I, I had a drink when I called my wife, and the whip gets cracked. He's like, oh, can't think of a name. This leader will be called leader. Like I think <laughs> was just, I've not seen my wife and yeah. children in years. Like you said, let me go uh, in Hasbro or just like <laughs> no. I want to see the lore books. I want to know the history behind find leader uh if his parents knew he was predestined you know anything like that uh, <laughs> yeah. leader can you his brother your son, can, can you imagine naming your son leader and it turns out he's a yeah. beta bitch leader yeah. his sister boucher uh and then his brother <laughs> taylor i'm surprised um, his taylor. sister's not called sheeter yeah oh Sheer. don't get me started <laughs> um, um i was gonna say one thing flavor wise with caldheim it's a big question i've had right um, the previous Vorinclex had Infect, right? The one from uh, Euphrexia. Let me just double check that for you. Because he doesn't, he doesn't have Infect in Call Time. I'm not sure if that's a. He like was originally a, a here. He is Vorinclex, voice of hunger. He was a seven six for for eight with trample. Whenever you tap a land for mana, add one mana to your mana pool of that type a land could produce. Whenever an opponent taps a land for mana, that land doesn't. Okay, that may be a different one. I'm looking at. Give me a sec. I'll look for the other Vorinclexes. Uh, I mean, um, the then if he doesn't have infect at all, then it, my my question's been answered. I was just wondering why he doesn't do poison counters in call no, time. I was wondering he... if that was like a thing, like. Um, and no, that's just him. Uh, that's just uh, well, that's just him, baby. No, uh, his previous <laughs> iteration was more of a land. That's really weird. Even his previous version, well, it wasn't for Rex. He was a prayer. Um, it's really weird to see it in an infect. I mean, not every Phyrexian yeah. card has infect. Law Phyrexians do a lot no, of yeah, things. Yeah. But I see what I you just mean. Wonder why. I mean, I, I honestly, I, I would put good money on it that um, whoever designed Vorinclex was going to put infect on it before they saw how ridiculous that could be. Because see, if he did have infect and say a board yeah, witch card, be a one hit, or one he literally death. could be a one hit done, that is it dead. Mm -hmm. yeah. Vorinclex, what basically... you can give him infect. Yeah, Graft of Exoskeleton, he's got. In 
a cool good. commander oh, yes. deck name, Vorinclex Army of One. Uh, that's all. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, that'd be I a mean, good kind of I, name. I guess flavor wise, that does make sense because the predators are not the ones who are spreading the Frexian oil. It's the it's the mooks, it's the minions who are spreading the oil. So why would they have the ability to infect land and people with the oil? When it's their the people that like work for them that are actually yeah, doing that e- e- even physical as older, thing. E- even as older Billy is very much of that of a general. He's tapping down land so it really can't be used to the general mm. and it's showing his eminence. And even now he's got more of a general ability. He makes his his troops stronger and more yeah. deadlier while robbing that from the enemy. I mean, like even mm. just look at the flavor. Some people just play Magic the Gathering because they like slinging really expensive cardboard around. Some people play it for the lore. I'm there for both. And even the flavor in that card you know he's a praetor you know he's a general and he's a badass commander he's like not only do i make my pawn stronger i'm making my enemy weaker like dude mm. uh, i this is a full-on spoiler but after that card got revealed i already started starting him to appear in my campaign oh kill me yeah um, oh boy that's terrifying uh i just i like Vorin Klex so much i really love his alternate art for kaldheim as well the alternate art just feels so nice and the borders are just so good dude i just can't get over it so nice um you love to see it one thing i wanted to say really quick and harry i'll tangent it off here and let you get back to your other fave cards um i mean honestly i was done but yeah oh okay um we had someone on our live stream the other day uh a friend of ours say why do you guys think foretell is good and i went into kaldheim being like oh maybe he's right maybe foretell isn't all that Wow, yeah. what bullshit I wrought yeah, upon myself. No, man. Foretell has saved my ass more times mm-hmm. than I care to count. Um, it's just, it's, it's trap cards from Yu Gi Oh! Oh, it's, it's it so is, good. Like, yep. It's so. And the thing is, even in our live stream, fucking go back and watch. I think Harry or Kingsley played a Foretell card in the first, it was Harry because Kingsley was making his deck. In the first game, Harry foretelled something. I was like, what's up with that card? Is it like an adventure? And Harry's like, I foretelled it. I was honestly the point in that. And Harry was like, what's well, kind of like trap cards from Yu Gi Oh? And I'm like, I'm just not excited for it. Three turns later, I was like, yep, okay, I want to have a Foretell deck. <laughs> Because this is fucking AIDS. This is yeah, so fucking AIDS. Because so it's literally like it's like you know what it is. It's like a it's like a spicier version of manifesting. Because manifesting are on the board for telling. It's sitting in exile. Unless someone's going to do something to your exile pile, you're good. With manifesting and morphing, your cards are on the board as two twos and can be shot, can be whatever. For telling, they just sit there and act prey. I mean, literally, I'm just going to quickly t- touch on it because no one brought it up and it's nothing crazy. Just Doom Scar. It's a five cost board wipe to all creatures. Five, you can get a lot better board this or four. You can foretell this and pay three for a board wipe. Like, fuck me. Mm-hmm. There's a... And there's you just a, have it floating. Just have yeah. it floating. There's a great creature called Vengeful Reaper, which is something I really like. Uh, black Angel. Uh, a Black Angel Cleric. Um, it's a it's a four drop, but with Foretell, it's a two drop, two, three, with Flying, Death Touch, and Haste. Are oh, you it's silly? Kind of like a, it's kind of like a Olympia version of Are Nighthawk. you silly? It's so cool. Um, and then there's also the mm. Battle Mammoth, which the Battle Mammoth isn't so much like a very great card. Um, it just has like a nice ability and it has Trample, but it's a it's a five drop, but you can foretell it for four. Um, mm. It's great. And then you can also Oof, foretell yeah. some great... Uh, look, I just... Oh, I love foretelling. It's such a cool mechanic. Um, oh, I really like I'm it sorry, a lot. guys. I just, uh, I just totally realized something. I might have to make this totally disgusting. Uh, I was looking over my Google Docs there for something I wanted to talk about, and I saw a commander I have in here that says, uh, quite, "I saw I build my commander desk Google Docs before I go to my local game store and hand them a piece of paper so they can get me the cards." And there's a card here. I'm going to completely rework this deck. He's some double masters. His name is Mazarik Cruel Death Priest. He's Golgarian three for a flying two two. Whenever a player sacrifices another permanent, put a 1 1 counter to his you control. Imagine pairing this with Tigrid and Vorniclex. Mm. Oh. You're I'm stealing God. everything they're sacrificing, you're getting counters, and Vorniclex is doubling the counters. Holy shit. Disgusting. That is the commander I'm going to make. Holy um, fuck. There's a, that there's is a, amazing. There's a, like a, a full, uh, no, not no mana, but like. Um, there's a creature called Scorn Effigy that is just an artifact creature. Uh, you can foretell it, and then it costs zero. It just costs nothing. No, uh, and I it's a 2-3. Uh, 
And one thing, because like I, I want to play around a bit in my four tails, so I probably will be picking up um, the four tail precon deck. Uh, the last precons were bad. The He's... wireless deck, the wireless deck, I just bought because I wanted some of the yeah. cards out of it. The Zendikar Command decks were absolutely great. The decks after that were terrible, but I'm looking forward to these precons with Carlton's Commander decks because the four tail mm -hmm. one I'm pretty interested around to give it a wee little look see. Correct me if I'm wrong here as well, but with four tail, right? You can you effectively self-impose exile on the creature so you don't have to discard it uh like it can't be dealt with until you deal out the card well no it, mm. technically it could be okay um, now if someone says return exile artifact whatever you can't do it because you don't know what it is but if there's a card that says uh return uh, all cards from exile to the graveyard from target players exile pile then that would pull it because like adventure uh, it, it can be targeted if you have cards that say target exile like for example could say target player shuffles their exile pile into their deck that would ruin foretale but there are so so little exile deal with cards mm -hmm. uh, which is kind of safe because say you want to play it now it might be destroyed in the board straight away i want to keep it in my hand ah uh, some of it made me for for to discard my hand foretale you can just throw it to your exile and let it be safe which is yeah. pretty nice um i Absolutely. just realized something as well um i was literally about to say god i wish there was something something like murder but you could foretell it um poison the cop uh yep. <laughs> yeah, poison the cop destroy target creature if this spell was foretold scry two um if you're playing with realm walker you can just fucking oh look kaldheim no i have a question i can't endless. remember i think a uh, i think with i think the foretell cards still work like regular cards so you can't foretell a sorcery uh, as an instant speed no you cannot you have no. to do okay. it the, like when you would be able oh, to play oh, that card but, but holy shit see this, this is why I'm, no dude you can fucking break foretell all oh, my decks are going to get so much more disgusting there's a card that is a commander staple called the dalkin ori it reads uh or it's enough memory. No, this is, uh, this is how much it reads. The Dalkin Ori lets you cast any cards as if they had flash. So Definitely. if you oh, get anything wow. in foretell, you are put. Oh my god, that because it doesn't specify from where. It's just or is it from your hand? No, it doesn't specify from anywhere. So which means you can foretell your board wipes, foretell anything at the sorcery or creatures, and then have a Dalkin Ori out in the board, and then instant speed all your foretells. Oh, that's God, a conspiracy that's card, right? That's a that's hey, a. Let me check because I remember. I can't remember. I, I, I know it's worth it so much money. Uh, Valdalkin. Because I've got a I've got a full booster box that I still yeah, need to send you. Yeah, I'm waiting for you. You need to fucking still send me. Uh, what said did it come in? Blah, 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 blah. Uh, rare effect a card. No. What Watch me be right about in? something magic related. Valdalkin. <laughs> oh wait, yeah, Magic the Gallant conspiracy. <laughs> Nice. Finally, I am back. The nice. champion of the source himself, Kingsley Giles. Well, actually, if you watch mm. our last, uh, when you see our calling Friday Night Fortnite, I, Ali, am champion of the source. So okay, look, we can move it past it. Uh, move <laughs> before past we, it. Before we leave Cal time, I just want to suck the dick of one more card, and that mm. is Coma Cosmo Serpent. He is a seven cost commander. Now, People might be thinking, why play a seven cost commander? Well, let me tell you why. Also, you're talking to a guy who plays M um, uh, Ember Cleave, sorry, Kozilik, who's a 12 cost commander. <laughs> or sorry, 10 cost. But for a seven cost commander in Simic colours, it's a uh, it's uh, two green, two blue, three generic, he's a six six. This spell can't be countered. Now, if you're playing a seven cost commander, you fucking hope it won't be countered. You're gonna be absolutely livid because it'll be cost ten next time you summon it. But at the beginning of each upkeep, not just yours, every player's upkeep. So if you're sitting in a four-player game, that's 12 power on the board right there and then. Uh, mm. My quick math was correct. Um, uh, at the beginning of each upkeep, create a 3-3 three, three blue serpent token, creature token named Coma's Coil. Its abilities are, and these are instant speed, sacrifice another serpent, choose one. Tap target permanent, its active abilities can't be activated this turn. Our Coma Cosmos Serpent gains indestructible at the end of the turn. So not only does this card protect itself against board wipes, targeted removal, things like that, apart from exiling or sacrificing, you can also tap down your opponent. They've got a crazy big card, or, they, or they've got Vornaclex and all these infect cards. You can just keep sacking your uh, creatures, and uh, that's them uh, tapped down. Now, if you get a doubling season out, you get double the tokens. 
you are getting two serpents every upkeep you can keep feeding them to call a tacoma and you can keep tapping down everything your opponents have and the thing is yeah it isn't a flying people might be thinking well what if someone wants to this is a commander any commanders that are hard to deal with on the ground you fly over them not with this card you'll stack your serpents and tap down the flyers this card is just oof it is so fucking good and then oh god there's so many just hit them with there. a water knot as well so like once they tap <laughs> they just can never untap it's <laughs> truly horrifying wild. and it's uh, in semi colors uh, this card is in semi colors which yeah. you already know is one of the strongest colors out there yeah, i hate it uh harry what were you trying to what were you trying also, to say also i feel really bad for kingsley uh, our editor and also our host because you're gonna have to put all these cards on yeah the screen. i I already thought about it, uh, and I should have started taking notes, but I uh, Okay, l- l- let me, no, let me no. quickly just list off 20 more cards in quick fire so you can add all okay, these Okay, okay, moving Ready? on Three, so two, quickly. Three, two, one. We're going to start with Malachi. Okay, Malachi. moving on so fast. Um, uh, <laughs> you rat fucking uh, Immer Strong Predator. Uh, no, 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 no. no. Uh, uh, Malachi uh, Vivor, uh, Malachi Meyer, uh, uh, over all four. Got stories. Is, uh, Sela Ice Shaper, Manolith, uh, Tigger, God of Gold Pride. Span Dragon. Uh, uh, and, and the Betrays, Ur Dragon. Uh, Tiamat, let me see my Dungeons and Dragons. I fucking uh, lost it. Tiamat's here now. Nick, you're watching this. <laughs> Either I did it or I didn't. Um, uh, and if I did, just know that I hate these two. Um, if, uh, if, if Tiamat, when Tiamat comes up, I want a custom card created. I want you to balance it as well, because if it's unbalanced, I don't want you to include it in the podcast, if that's possible. Or, or um, we hold this episode back until the Forgotten Realm set comes out, and maybe they print Tiamat. Oh, and, and then, <laughs> and then, and and then, then if they I, don't, cool. if they don't, we'll just be like, this is where Tiamat would go if they yeah. had printed. And then Call Time, uh, Call Time is months out of out of date, and everyone's like, why are these idiots talking about Call Time? Like it just like it's a we'll new do, thing. We'll, we'll yeah. Forgotten. Well, so what we'll do is what we'll do is we'll. We'll remaster this episode. We'll delete it and re-upload it with the Tiamat card in there when it comes out. Mm. I just took a lung full of smoke. I can't believe you said we'll remaster the podcast. Um, I there are certain remaster. things I stand for as a creative individual. That is not one of them. I want to die. Um, thanks so everyone. Um, Very epic. Christ alive! I completely lost my train of thought, and you're listening to me find it again, Harry. No you worries. were saying something earlier. You may have forgotten. Um, yeah, yeah, I think it was a bunch of cards. Do you want to hear away, what Harry. I was gonna say? <laughs> Please, the Harry. The thing I was gonna say is I don't know because I forgot it, and that's fine. <laughs> that oh, is you, uh, fine. You are truly the worst of all of us. Speaking about forgetting fun little things, um. I bet you little fuckers forgot yeah. that we do topic rolls on this damn here show. Yeah. Uh, so why don't we I take it away? With that, <laughs> no, so, so basically, you just got a 12 No, go on, let's, 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 not, let's not explain it again. Uh, grab a d20, <laughs> cut a few sides off. Um, I'm going to roll the d20 of fate and magic, and let's see what we get. Could you That's... carve a d12 out of a d20? You can if there's a drill that can pierce the heavens. There's a D twenty. That's a D twelve. Oh, <laughs> well, on on oh, that yeah. spiritual guidance note, that's going to be a six, which means the number six is how to handle a player death as a DM. Oh, Sorry, we should we should one. stipulate a player character death. Uh, yes. Not an so actual you're not ready story. for that and, and, kind of and, question. And in our topic rules, it says PC, and I thought, well, if someone listening is not a PC, is my brain is say a player because NPC is end all people character. Yes, playable character. We don't want to go into a player's death because, well, each to their own, and let's not keep it that morbid. So, uh, player <laughs> yeah. characters deaths as a DM. Who wants to take this one away? Uh, I don't have a lot of experience with it, but I I've killed I know one how to player, be a, and that's it. I know how I know how to be a normal, regular, functioning human being. So yeah, that's like, how <laughs> uh, I can probably well, answer sorry, this. Sorry, Harry. This question, the topic <laughs> rule is: as a DM, DMs aren't normal, functioning people. Uh, they're control. They're controlling maniacs with over creative uh, imaginations. They're not sure. people. <laughs> I I think picking up on this question, so the thing about PC death, right, is it is a really, really finicky thing. It's super persnickety um, because you do want to be inserting a reasonable level of like, my character can fail doing this 
or doing a thing or fighting something, there's always the threat of death at some point in some places. Now, you never want to be uh, three fucking goblins jump out the ground, stab you to death, and you're dead, you idiot. <laughs> like, that's not how you want to be running your games. That's not how you should... At no, all! Like, that's just not fun! Uh, I just realized, should we take a quick moment of silence for all the player characters that died out there? Yeah, yeah. let's let's take yeah. a quickie. Let's take a little quickie. I am made of no idea. Santa Maria, Santa Maria. Okay. In the arms of. Wait, we'll get. We'll get. Mm -hmm. Never mind. In the arms of a beholder. Hey, uh, they don't have, have arms. arms. Literally eyes. don't have arms. Uh, <laughs> they can dream, my friend. Yeah. So, anyways, on the topic of player deaths, it's yes. a really, really fine line. It's a super, super fine line. Um, Between hilarious it, and devastating. No, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and it mean, actually. It, yeah. It really is the context, right? Like what you just said is a really fine line between like what is, what is funny and what is like genuinely heartbreaking, right? Because you do have to kind of look at the <laughs> spectrum of like how did the character die? And also like in what way were you planning on it happening this way? In what kind of encounter did they die? You don't oh. want someone to die in an encounter that meant nothing, right? I'm you don't already want to... laughing at this because my party got TPK'd three days ago. <laughs> no. Uh, yes, fun. to um, the most beautiful woman ever, my fiance. Uh, and um, it was mostly the player's fault. Can't not get a DM at all. But uh, we have a tiny little home game for uh, myself, Danny, and Tom, and DMs. Because we were not all in a game together. We actually aren't. Um, we all want to play together. And they're just RP and be goofy. Tom runs a great one, a little small thing once a year for us where we play our wizards and our bard and we just have some fun. And so, and then one where me, Tom, and Danny can play together. And we. We were tracking down this mage in a world where magic's outlawed, which is hilarious because the party consists of two wizards that are twins and a druid. So, um, we uh, have to be smart about it, but we were uh, tracking down this wizard. A rogue wizard to destroy, or to deal with. Uh, my character got in, talk, and got in touch with a witch who's a bit too powerful, and she said that she would give him knowledge. Uh, he's also my first lawful evil character, but some knowledge if he, if I, my character would go take out her old apprentice, who absconded with her power and fucked off. And he, my guy was like, yeah, we can do that, no problem. And we uh, bit the shit out of this guy after he was beating the shit out of us. But was, after a while, uh, I was fighting him one-on-one -on -one to test his pill work to see if it was worth betraying the witch to join with him. And after that, this like one-on-one -on -one kind of Agni Kai thing, not really doing lethal force to each other, um, he hit me for a lot of damage because it was really funny because I got hit and uh, my brother, who's Tom's character, my twin brother, was like, Crow, are you okay? And I was like, she's like, yeah, actually fine. And then the next attack hit me for 22 as a level 3 wizard and brought me into two hit points. Oh. And because it looked like a con for days. Oh, no. uh, and I was into two hit points. I mean, that happened. I described how bloody it was. Danny the Druid welches into a bear and pinned the guy. And fucking Tom goes over with magic and starts blasting the guy at like fucking point blank. And then I grappled him to try and grab the necklace off him and gave him his power. And he started putting his hands up and he went, I'm going to cast Circle of Death if you don't all back off right now. And earlier on in the fight, he counterspelled my level 2 spell. So I was thinking, he's fucking bluffing. What kind of big bad mage that has access to 6th level spells would counterspell a 2nd level chromatic orb? So... I was like, you're fucking bluffing. You can't, you can't just put a second level spell. You can't cast that. And he was like, I'm going to do it. I'm going to do it. And Tom was like, yeah, yeah, you little bitch. And then uh, Tom even said, well, if we let you go, why wouldn't you cast it anyway? Just, well, you're like, what's to stop you from casting when we let you go? Let's we'll just fucking kill you. He full on cast Circle of Death. <laughs> oh, <laughs> so my God. I think, I think Anne had realized because she went, you all take... 33 points of damage. It was three level threes. And I, went, I burst out laughing and went, I'm dead. And I went, really? And Danny went, I'm dead as well. And Tom went, I'm me. <laughs> and she was like, no, 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 wait a minute. And luckily she had done the math wrong. 
unluckily, we all still died. She went, oh, it's 29 <laughs> points of damage. And we all looked at each other and went, we're all still dead. And oh, I was no. like, oh no. God. And we were like, and we were like, cause the thing is, we're all DMs. We're like, dude, it's totally okay. Like, we weren't angry. We weren't like, fuck you. We were like, we were laughing at the table, like, cause we were so sure this mage was just talking shit. So we, we were laughing. We weren't mad or angry at all. I know sometimes a player does people get angry. But we just thought it was so funny. And I, I, luckily there was guards nearby. They came back and revivified. They came and revivified us all. A nice little MacGuffin. But I'm not complaining. I love playing my lawful evil wizard. But it was hilarious because we totally brought it on ourselves. And we were saying to Anne, like, it wasn't your fault. You warned us in character four times. It's just our three characters are absolute shitheads. And we were like, <laughs> <laughs> like, that's what we said. I was like, and Anne's like, I'm at bad DM. We're like, no, I was like, babe, you can't be. You fucking warned us three times. The dude was like, like, I'm a seriously cast. I went on. I can tell you, as I, a DM myself, I would have fucking given the players in character, well, depends on the character's personality, but maybe one warning and then done. You give us fucking three before he dropped that shit. Like, it's our <laughs> own fucking fault. The dude told us three times, I'm gonna do it. I'm, a, I'm not kidding. I'm a fucking, even after we said, you can't do it, he's like, well, I fucking can. We were like, ah, <laughs> shut up, bitch. We're gonna fucking kill this guy. No. He killed all of us. Luckily, we're all resurrected. So, and that's why I was so that's why I was just laughing, Harry, when you were saying, like, when you were talking about death, I just couldn't stop laughing because, like, I think that's, like, the first... I, I've had a character die before as a player and it sucked. But that one was just so funny, man, because, like, <laughs> <laughs> it was our own yeah. fucking fault. And, like, the, the energy that was there was, like, the energy I have with you guys, just crackhead energy. So when, like, yeah. when, we, get, so when we, like, all look at our DM and tell our DM we're dead, it's just funny because, like, we all three died at the same time where each one of us during Cute. the fight were, like, he's... It wasn't just one guy pulled the trigger and was, like, he's talking shit. Me, Danny, and Tom were all, like, saying to him... We weren't saying the DM's line, we were saying we thought the wizard was lying. We we're like, oh, this fucking guy, get a load of this guy, I'll fucking kill him. And <laughs> no, um, he fell on yeah. him. It's just the fact Absolutely. that you started by saying, yeah, it was kind of our fault, and then proceeded to go into how you goaded a fucking wizard to kill you. <laughs> I mean, dude, yeah. if you counter spell, uh, the thing is, incredible. after the session was done, and I was talking to Anne after Danny and Tom went home, and she was like, she feels so bad about it. And I was like, it's not your fault. We, it, we did it to ourselves. And I was like, but also, he counterspelled a second level spell. What kind of badass wizard counterspells that? And then I pointed out and said, you asked him to show you what he could do, so he showed you, and I was like, oh... Yep, did not, did not even cross my mind. Now, it's hard playing a hyper-intelligent character when I, Ali, am a fucking idiot. Like, <laughs> my character, Crow, he is lawfully evil, but he puts his smarts before anything. He doesn't get attraction to women or men. He only cares about science and putting and growing forward as a mage he wants to become the strongest mage that ever lived to take the world as his throne so he doesn't care about the nitty gritty he doesn't want to waste his, he doesn't want to waste time on anything like even when Anne described this amazingly beautiful barmaid i ali was like when i hit that but i was like no crow wouldn't crow only he doesn't want to waste time doing anything that isn't work on spells and I play him so high because his stats are good. Like when it's relaxed RP, not in combat, I can play him hyper intelligent. But when the day start rolling and clickety clack start sounding off, man, I become just this as a wizard, a fucking like a cowboy with finger guns, man, with the war destruction at my fingertips. And man, like Crow would have been like, wait, it's a possibility he could be lying. But I was just so into the combat. I was like, this motherfucking bitch is lying. Kill him. <laughs> nope, nope. He was. Full on telling the truth and we all died. <laughs> <laughs> I've um Incredible. The only time I've come close as a DM killing uh is in a campaign that I play with you guys, obviously Pirates of the Dreadlands, which uh in which our rogue character, our rogue fat cat tabaxi Jin, um, got cursed with mummy rot. Um, well, that's not and the was... only time. You almost killed me and Anna as well in our prequel game. Oh, that's true. That is very when true. You had, when you had 12 cultists all take their turn at the same time and they all swarmed my character while he was well shaped into a wolf and I had 12 attacks at advantage all at me and they all fucking hit. Yeah. Um, <laughs> I do good, you know? What can I say? I, I'm the kind of DM who's like, here's an encounter. I made it up. I don't know what the solution is. You're creative players. Find it out. Um, and I just love doing shit like that, but obviously it can lead to a lot of, like, 
PC death, um, not player <laughs> death, not player death, because I'm not like oh, walking out from behind my God, DM I... screen with a fully loaded Glock. God, but, like, I wish we, I, I wish one of us was good at art, because when you've done that voice, I'd love to pop up on the screen like the Microsoft version of the paper paperclip, but as a DM just pops up and it's like, "Hi, I see you're DMing a game. You trying to kill your players? Can I assist you? <laughs> Can I assist you?" <laughs> And it just oh, slides incredible. you the stats for a, to, a fucking Tarask. Um, <laughs> put put a scroll of Tarask in your player's next big loot find. They'll love it. Oh, um, God. Can I read this scroll? Yeah, of course you can. What does it do? Oh, there's a Tarask behind you. Um, no, oh. but but dealing with that, it's it's literally like either as a DM, when you kill a player, it is like you do go through all of that shit where it's like, did I kill them at the right time? I obviously didn't, like, it's not a purposeful thing. It's more like manslaughter. I didn't mean to kill you. The things I'm controlling just happen to kill you. Um, that needs yeah. a better and name, you... man. Because I used to think as a kid, manslaughter meant you slaughtered lots of men. Legitimately, mm. as a child, I thought that. <laughs> yeah, as a child, you also thought you could produce ice cubes from your hands, but we'll move away from that. Hey, I fucking um, thought if I ran hard enough on a pool, I could run on water. Because yeah. you told me Maddie ran on water in Spain, and I believed you. Yeah, uh, <laughs> idiot. <laughs> <laughs> fucking idiot um but it is when you're dealing with pc death you've really just got to consider like shit is this what i wanted then what are the ramifications of this now this pc's dead obviously the player may have a backup character if it's not that campaign they might not um so you've got to work with that player and just be like okay your old player used to be something like a uh a druid do you want to be another similar like caster type or do you want to be a martial type or do you want to be like a bard um every a bard. character i'd love to run a campaign where it's like once you die you come back as a halfling bard i um, want to run a campaign <laughs> where everyone's a bard and they're a traveling they're a traveling band <laughs> yeah dude there's so many ideas for campaigns but not enough time not enough players and not enough like Actually, that's a lie. There's a lot of self-loathing, but not enough, like, self-hate. Well, that's a See, lie. See, I, um, I, I want to be in a campaign where all the players are cleric multi-classed into bards, and they're all just called My Clerical Romance. Oh, fucking, that's <laughs> yeah. it. I'm done. I'm logging out. I'm jumping <laughs> so off sick. Discord. But uh, back onto the topic at hand, it really depends on the situation. You know what I mean? Like, mm -hmm. it, it can happen in so many different ways. First example, you poorly built an encounter. Mm -hmm. Say, just say for, because again, touching on what we talked about many episodes ago, um, with this challenge rating, say you've got five players that are level six, and you're like, they could take on five sixes are fucking 35. Uh, they could easily take on a fucking CR 23 Ancient Dragon. At oh. breath attacks, whole party's dead. That's yep. them gone. You perp you bet you badly built an encounter because you drastically mm. over, all overestimated your party and you drastically underestimated a dragon's breath attack. It could be another situation where, for example, uh, let's say your party has wronged a really powerful knight or they've wronged a really powerful person and he either tracks them down or as much or as many players do their hubris gets the better of them they're like we can totally take this guy out let's just say for example i'm doing a game for harry and kingsley and there's like three other players and say that kingsley goes down and the guy has pissed them off so much because usually my guys if someone goes down to my party the guy switches target because that's one less he's not like to worry about them they're unconscious i have to worry about the other eight of them that's how the guys work in my campaign unless they're what unless they're being unless they've been scorned and they're powerful enough to finish this person off and then turn around so let's say kingsley fucking pissed off this guy robbed him to the frame him killed his fucking best lieutenant and say that harry's like kingsley's down someone heal him in the next round and i'm like well actually no let's call the bad guy let's call the bad guy ali i'm like ali has a second attack and a third attack and he's going to use these two attacks to auto crit kingsley when he's unconscious just kill him right there and then because of the choices you made to piss this guy off that could be another situation you know yeah. what i mean where you want to teach your party mm. a lesson to be like you pissed off or even let's say Let's say there's this fabled knight and he's at the bottom. He was sealed away for all the time to how powerful he was. He wasn't able to be. He wasn't even able to be killed, so they locked him away. And the party are like, "Dude, we could totally kill him and get all that loot." And they go down, and he fucking kills them all because that's his own fucking. That's the party's own fault. Mm. On the other end of that, it could be so easy to happen. It's happened to me from my bad luck of dice rolling, where it's a regular encounter, and maybe someone's a bit too cock heavy, or someone just has bad luck. And they dropped zero hit points. They roll a death save, not one. 
That's two immediate fails. They roll another death save, and it's under 10 and they die. That can also happen. Like, it could be such a normal encounter where it's a bunch of the party against some bandits, or it's a party in a tavern fight. Never, pardon me, never underestimate the bad luck of dice, because you could get a nat 1 get two failed death yep. saves and get below 10 and that's not even like your own fault like that could literally like say it's a regular players going down un unconscious in the combat could be a semi common depending on the the see like the, the hardness of your campaign but also like dice can be unforgiving you could get say for example like it's a regular fight you just get critted once and you're like well, hopefully the dice go low and they roll all high numbers and you go unconscious well that was just a freak accident of you being critted Give me a death save, not one, and then another not one, or not one and anything else. That's you dead from just one crit, and then you're bad dice rolling. So death can happen in a multiple ways uh, in a campaign. I personally, I'm not going to, if a player dies, not going to go, oh, you magically come back to life, because death needs to mean something in my campaign. Mm -hmm. I'm also not out to kill my party. Now, death can happen, and death has happened once in my campaign. That was just bad luck. The party's pissed off a main flayer. Uh, and mind flares can grapple and stun. There was two players stunned. Uh, he grabbed one of them because was, she was closer, and the mind flare told the party, said, if you don't back off, I'm going to fucking kill one of your party members. And the whole party were like, he's looking hurt, we can take him out. He lived that round of combat, he grabbed the party's cleric, and then said, and put his mouth over her head and said, I'm giving you one last chance Drop your weapons and leave me alone or I will kill your party member before you can kill me. Before my body hits the ground, I will kill your party member. That is the warning I give. And every player in, in my campaign, in my, in my party, said, okay, let's do it. Apart from two of them. Two of mm -hmm. them lunged forward to attack the main flare and the main flare had a held action. And it all happens at the same time killed the party member who was in the party at the very beginning for a year of the campaign or their cleric died that also was the only cleric that could cast a revivify they had no paladin no divine sorcerer just no one to do revivify the party dealt with death for the first time but in that death it also taught the party a lesson now i felt sick to my stomach oh we all did uh, I felt so sick. I never want to kill a player. I have fun sometimes making a hard encounter. I always make sure my encounters are beatable. And one thing I take great solace in is a couple times in my campaign, players have said, like one or two players in my name players have went, this is impossible, we can't do this. And either Kings there and or someone else will say, this Ali built an encounter. He always builds encounters that we can beat unless we've decided to jump into something that's over our heads. But regular encounters are always designed so we can win. And that's true. But I felt sick killing one a good friend of mine IRL, and two killing my first ever player. You know when you when you look into DM and DM in a game, you would be surprised how because for me all my players are my children, all their characters are my children, and it felt like cutting the, the fucking head of a puppet or the strings of a puppet. Uh, it sucked, it hurt, but I wasn't going to renege it and go all of a sudden she comes back to life because she's a god's daughter. Well, that's not fair. Someone else dies. A regular person. Death has to mean something. I can't give mm -hmm. anyone special treatment. I could have easily said your mother, the god Maleki, appears and revives you. What if Mortis dies? What if Quinn dies? What if people that don't have holy backgrounds die? That's unfair for them. It has to be all fair. Now, her death kind of meant something. It was while they were in the Underdark trying to get a peace to change the world and to get an NPC and a good friend of the party back. That meant something. Now, death is okay if it means something. If you're a DM out there and your player dies to a fault of their own or to bad luck of the dice, don't feel bad. Now, you are going to feel bad, but this shit happens. It's better, though, if it means something. Now, say this death, the character's called Sylvia, happened when they were out camping and you take your watches and one of them saw a bunch of goblins and say that goblin got lucky with a crit and she got bad luck with death saves. She died in the middle of the woods just in the, on the way to a side quest or even just on the way to a town. That doesn't mean anything and it kind of feels shitty. Death can actually be a good thing if it matters, but... If it's like a sacrifice. Yeah, but a death that doesn't matter and holds no merit and could have easily been avoided... That kind of sucks. It, it but, looms over you as well. But again, now this, Harry Kings may have completely different views from me on this, but again, I cannot stress, 
if your party is challenging you and trying to railroad you as a DM and they say, we want to fight that ancient dragon that flew over our heads because we know dragons have good hordes. And you say, look, we're going to cut the RP and I'm going to tell you guys as players, you're too low level to fight a dragon of that caliper right now. Let's go into higher levels. And they go, no, we want to do it. Then you take pleasure in burning them alive because some lessons need to be learned through that. But death is hard to handle as a DM depending on the situation. Like it could be like that's just the thing. I feel for I feel for me, Kings and Harry, to fully talk about this topic. We have to spend a whole podcast just talking about it because death dealing with death as a DM can be in a, such a magnitude of ways. You guys know what I mean from just different ways it could happen yeah. to different things. Uh, I mean, it could even happen. A little, um, little wink to my players. They're going to be meeting a mage soon that takes no shit. And say one of the players is like, fuck you, you scumbag. You're fucking gay and I'm going to fucking kill you. Then they won't. Uh, then I would be like, well, I've wrote this guy as a take no shit type of wizard who spent a long time locked away. He would be well within his right to look at a player and go power word kill because they wronged him. Yeah. Um, that's just, I, 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 that's that's just a demonstration of power. Um, Currently, I think the only person who would survive a power word kill in our party is uh, is our barbarian, <laughs> and that would be it. Uh, He's yeah. just like, oh god. But yeah, th- dealing with I've I have actually never had a this isn't like a, a brag or a flex. I've never had a PC that died. Um, me as a player, I've never had a PC run a PC that's died. That doesn't mean I haven't come fucking close. Um, and what you do, like, I know we're talking about this as a DM, but as a DM and as a player, you have to appreciate the death as a narrative moment, as a story beat. Um, the Dark Knight of the Soul. We talked about the hero's journey a while ago. Um, and it serves for greater development for the rest of your characters. Say, for instance, um, one path me and Ali considered, because it's always important to talk to your DM, um was that my character may actually take the death very hard and turn into an Oath of Vengeance paladin. Um, But I think... Yeah, it can be big big story beats like that. Yeah, yeah. And and it's it's about not moving past, past the death and brushing it under the carpet, but looking at the death and saying, okay, this has happened and I'm being presented an opportunity to create a narratively interesting moment for my party. Um, say it happens in the middle of a camp or um, in the middle of a session that you're doing, you might not want to end it there. Um, but say it happens closer to the end of a session. That's a very interesting cliffhanger to keep your players hooked and give you time to develop something that is narratively satisfying for all of the players I, and for you as a DM. I do have something to add to this, but I'll wait till you're done, Kingsley. Oh, no, that's me. That's my rant over. Oh, well, now... There is going to be a few listeners out here, and I am not attacking you when I say this. You, Every person is completely entitled to their opinion, and this isn't a, you're entitled to your opinion, fuck off. No, no, every opinion is valid in the space we're in. We, us three at Saving Throws here care about growing our space and growing with the community, not telling people how they play D&D is wrong. We may have personal opinions that differ, but no one's opinion to play D&D is wrong unless it's about playing a game that doesn't involve fun. Then I will come out and say that's wrong. Yeah. But Or if you're playing a, a fully lot, racist game, we don't stand for that shit. I, I said it before, I'm in a lot of D&D Facebook pages, I follow a lot of D&D things on Twitter and, a lot, and all that crap, and people always ask questions of like i've seen dms ask questions like how to deal with a death i've seen players go my character dies and i feel really shit about it anyone know how to get past the grief of a fictional character dying people are like it's D, man fucking suck it up character death is normal well i can cool. say as a guy who is in five games a week and a dm death is not normal for me personally the gay every dm dms differently and they are not bad dms for dm in the way they want to dm we all dm us three me harry and kingsley are all insanely close we all dm very differently and that's not a bad thing so maybe you dm in a gritty campaign where death is normal i can just say as, as a player in the dm death isn't normal in my thing and this is a segue into what i'm going to talk about No matter how the death happens, treat your player with respect after it happens. Don't go, well, your character fucking died because you were an idiot. Roll a new character sheet. Now, I'm a freak and I have 10 characters spare that I've got backstories written for that I can swap in. They say I died at the very beginning of a session. If the DM said to me, like, look, sorry, you're going to have to sit here until the session's done. I'd be like, cool, we'll put my laptop in place in Magic Arena or I'll sit on my phone and talk to my friends. 
Or a DM could say to me, do you have a character ready we can just bring in randomly? I could be like, yeah, I've got fucking 10 to pick from. What do you want? <laughs> but don't just be like, if a, if, a, if a character death happens really early on, go, right, put another character in. Don't just void that death. Now, maybe some players out there aren't attached to their characters and it's kind of like, um, I can't remember the fan-made D&D movie. Uh, where the guy's like hide behind the body of dead bards I love that movie so much uh, Harry and Kingsley will, uh, we'll have to watch you guys more for the wedding uh, it's a great movie uh, it's, like, it's, a, it's a guy DMing a game but then all the players actually have like their armor on so as he DMs the game it's a movie about it they actually fight as like it's like it's an action movie it's like a fantasy movie and uh, this is all like fan made but don't just be like Right, who cares about that character? Get a character sheet ready for the next five minutes. Maybe they want to take the time. Maybe they want to wait until next session and actually digest that their character go to. Maybe there's people out there who, who don't get attached to their characters. If the character dies, they're like, oh, well, I'll play something else. Now, I, don't, I don't really care about that character. Maybe that's the case. I can tell you, me personally, I get super attached to my characters. There's not a character I've played that I didn't love to fucking pieces. And... I can tell you right now, if any of my characters I played died, yeah, I'm going to be bummed out about it. I'm not going to attack the DM. I'm not going to get mad. I'm just going to accept it. But there has to be that kind of grieving period because if you're attached to it and you spend hours making pages and pages of a backstory and you've got your Pinterest board and you've got these quotes and everything saved, yeah, it's going to suck when all that work kind of goes away. So kind of respect your players when that happens because you don't know the space they're in. They may be really, it may have hit them really hard that a character they love has died. Don't be like, well, fuck you, roll a new character. Just kind of let them deal with it and then bring in their character. Or again, if they want to come in ready to go, then bring them in straight away. But kind of respect your players when that happens because sometimes even more so if the death has come completely out of nowhere, it can kind of hurt a little bit. Yeah. Um, so always kind of respect your player in that because you don't know how they're going to take the death of their own PC that they spent hours making and falling in love with finding a voice for them, finding a face finding their clothes, their weaponry give them time, don't just be insensitive to it that's yeah. the only advice I can give you can tell often. me to go fuck myself and that's completely fair and just offering the advice that just give your player a bit of respect and don't just kind of walk over the dead body of their character off the back of that, like D and D. I mean, at least the way we play D and D, it doesn't have to be this. Um, but D and D for us is like a, a highly emotional game. Like you get very invested. So think not only about the character, but it might be nice even like for your other players to be like, "Hey, in this moment, or just you know, how are you processing this? Not you, the player, you, the character. How is you know Mortis processing this? Um, or Quinn, yeah. how are they processing this? Um, because on on you go. It, it's all important. I was basically just going to swing this Harry's way um, because Harry runs a high lethality campaign. Um, and I don't want to get any spoilers, but I just want to hear like, you you killed a you killed a PC. Uh, you didn't kill the player, uh, which was very kind of you to hold back. <laughs> That's a very um, different type of player killing. Yeah. <clears throat> I'm a very merciful DM. Yeah, but, but I mean, <laughs> I mean, I'm sure there's some DMs out there that fantasize about killing their players. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> there's Which always in, that in, one player, man. There's always that one fucking player. in that group. Find find another play group. Um, if someone's gonna trying to kill you, you're playing with Dexter. <laughs> Fuck out of there. Um, yeah, <laughs> Harry, Dex out of there. You uh, run a high lethality campaign. Um, we had a PC die in that. We talked about it a few episodes ago. Um. And I completely forgot about it up until now. I was literally going to ask you, how do you plan on dealing with PC death? Um, um, yeah, but, it's a question. Yeah, I mean, when we had our druid die... Um, Cleric. No, no, me and me and Harry in this campaign, how did it Oh, feel? right, sorry, my bad, my bad. Yeah, because while we talk about Sylvia, she was a cleric who died in a very emotional scene that Mortis still beats himself up about um, because it was a preventable death. The PC in Harry's campaign died in a way that was preventable, but it also, it felt weirdly like, right? Because it was like, yeah, it's a sacrifice, but at the same time, it didn't have to be. How was that for you as a DM? Just like dealing with that and the um, tremendous amount of death that surrounded that. So I always kind of knew that the scene was going to be just like a bunch of people die. Mm -hmm. And that was always going to be like... It, it didn't feel out of place to me that a PC would die because the whole ethos, like the thrust of that was a bunch of people are going to die and a bunch of people are going to get murdered. Um, I think it was like a totally acceptable choice by the player to like, I'm going to stand my ground. It's not what my character, my character wouldn't run away. I'm going to, I know I'm going to probably die here. 
which was what I was getting from the, I know I'm probably going to die here. Um, it really is, like Ali said, about respecting the player's wishes to be like, this is the scene that I want to run. Yeah. And like, if your player, and I know this is like not something that you see very often, if the player is committed to being like, this scene I'm going to run, I don't mind if my character dies, that's the story I'm trying to tell with them, then go for it. And also, because it's the setting works with that of like, if it's a high lethality setting, people die all the time. Even PCs die all the time um, because you're all just mooks. You're all guards. That's You're not special. You're not like the chosen warriors. Yeah. You are guards. You are mercenaries. You've been hired to do this thing. You are paid to silver to do this thing. Like, y you're not special, so you die. And it's like totally fair and within the logic of the world. Now, if I was running Root like a regular D&D &D campaign, for sure that would encounter might not end with a player or PC death, but it may end with you guys going to the bandit camp. They capture you and take you to the bandit camp, you know? Like if that was regularly how I was running that, it's really just about adjusting the tone of what you're doing here, you know? Like, yeah. how do people, like, it's adjusting about the tone, but also, how do you run your enemies, right? Because if your enemy, a high lethality campaign, if your enemy is going, um, gunning for death, um, a lot of people will play an enemy like they get someone to zero and they're down and they move on to the next person. If you're running high lethality, you're running someone who's a real bad motherfucker, um, you want them to be hitting them to zero... And then maybe you go and they don't stop hitting you. They're going to start stabbing you until you're dead, even when you're down. And that's a real dangerous situation. But it's also fun to see how the players at the table will go, this is a completely different thing. This is a completely different beast. These people are not going to stop until we die. And it's about gauging the reaction at your table and getting that sort of two-way street of like, is this something you guys want, first off? Because important thing about D, D, if you're playing it with your friends or whoever you're playing it with it's got to be fun if it's not fun then why are you doing it so you've got to make sure that your players are informed of the tone and the context and how you're running this campaign now of course when i ran my high lethality campaign i said to my players hey i'm running a campaign it's going to be high lethality your pcs might die maybe think about a secondary character that you might want to bring in um, and everyone who joined was like, yes, this is the tone I'm signing up for. I want to be involved in a story that tells this kind of narrative. And you go from there and you build from there. No one is surprised when their character dies. Because they're like, I was told this was probably going to happen at some point. That's to actually a very fair point. Uh, that is actually, I didn't even think of it. I didn't cross my That's a very fair point. If you start a campaign, the DM is like, look, everybody, this is a high lethality. Like, there's, like, healing potions aren't a thing. This is like where you can get fucking septus or whatever the fucking die. Your DM tells you that going in, that is, that, that that's a line drawn in the sand and that's mm -hmm. your choice to then walk past that line. And if mm, you yeah. die, you cannot give your DM any shit because you knew what you yeah. signed up for. Say if your DM says to you, it's going to be a really laid back fun campaign and two sessions in is a TPK because he planned it yeah. that way. <laughs> then you have the right to say, fuck you and find a different play group. But exactly. like, that's a completely fair. If I was a player in Harry's game and he said to me like, look, before you join, just ahead up there's a 90 percent chance you'll be playing three different characters throughout this campaign almost like a call of Cthulhu game i'd be like cool send me the fuck up i now know to have characters ready to bring in in case that happens so if your yeah. dm does give you the heads up before you start the campaign that look this is a highly realism highly realistic high highly lethal game then don't be surprised if bodies start dropping around yeah yeah and i mean the approach that you take to world building and how you generate stuff and that is like very different. Like when I started off a campaign like that, I literally told Kingsley and I literally told the people who are playing, um, there were going to be encounters in this that are just straight up unfair because it's not a video game. I've not designed a video game for you where you're always going to come out on top. Um, just understand there are going to be some things that I throw at you that you need to register. Hey, can I actually do this? Like I've this being put in front of me, but like, does the DM want me to do this? Uh, like, or is there like something else here that I'm trying to do? Is there a secondary objective? This is, is this a murder everyone and you win kind of situation or a, we need to get the fuck out of here. But there's a secondary objective kind of situation, you know? And like being open with your players and letting them know to think of those ways before you start the session um, is very, very useful and can kind of get you all on the same page, get you all parallel, you know? Yeah. Um, the thing is, uh, to just add on to that before I think we will be signing off. We will. Um, is mm -hmm. Just to add on to that is 
also don't give a d and we're gonna flip this we talked about dm respecting our players we'll give a little just a little thing to the players out there because this is this is a ma mainly dm subject but we're gonna go to the players um you also have to treat your dm with a bit of respect because for example for my case harry's case and kingsley's case when we're players we are i am no longer ally i am the character i am playing yeah. like i remember my first ever game i played with people they looked at me and went why are you doing that? We're your friends. And I went, no, you're Ali's friend. You are not Bellum's friend. Bellum just met you to like 10 minutes ago in a tavern, so I'm going to fucking pick your pockets. So yeah. some people are true to their character, so don't get in a DM's face for him staying true to the character that he has put forward as the big bad. Like, there could be a guy who his goal is, for example, see, this is, this is me, my, my, my brain's going right now. Say the big bad's an oath of conquest paladin. Their oath in the pa conquest paladin is defeating your enemies isn't enough. You have to break their spirits. That is the oath almost word for word. Now say that was the big bad and say he was bulldozing the party and one of the PCs dropped zero hit points at his feet and the party would need to get our bot friend and get out of here. I, if, a D if, that was what the, if that was the big bad idea presented me and he went... And now he's going to take two attacks to the unconscious player. I was like, what the fuck? Why would he do that? Well, he's breaking your fucking spirits. So one, you know not to fuck with him. And two, this is going to pay off better for us. One less guy he's got or girl he has to worry about down the road. So just a thing to the players out there that sometimes the DM is also... Because I can tell you, as a, as a DM who makes a lot of NPCs and has got lots of big bands, big, big, big bads planned... I will get in that character. I'm not the DM. I'm not my player's friends. I am the character they are sitting in front of right there and then. And don't give your DM shit for staying true to the character they created because they, they let you stay true to the character you created. Yeah. Um, and going, going off what Ali and Harry both said, I, it depends on how you run the game, but usually a scene has intentions. Even though Ali played a character that was a rogue, um, or rather probably wasn't a rogue actually, um, he was. but he was picking, oh, there we go, um, was picking people's pockets. That was a tongue twister. Um, you know, everyone knows the intention of the scene. Everyone knows where the scene has to head to, but that doesn't mean along the way you can't develop your character in media res. You know, you can't, you can, you know, come up with character quirks on the fly, but make sure you don't blindside your DM or the other players. Because the most important thing is, like Ali said and like Harry said, making sure everyone at the table has fun. You don't just randomly strike out against someone for doing something wrong, um, but you might strike out against them if they're doing something that will outwardly harm the party. You know, you, you've got to make sure that everyone has fun and everyone plays the characters in a way that is concurrent to the story in a way that will advance the story and make sure that everyone at the table has a good time. Um, speaking of having a good time, we've all had a lovely time here today and I think that's where we're going to draw the line in the snow. Um, please remember that you can find us anywhere online. You can follow our fancy new link tree to see all of our links to our Facebook, our Instagram, our YouTube, our Twitter, our SoundCloud, and maybe even possibly some other distribution platforms. Um, We've been saving throws. Please remember to like and subscribe. And if you don't, we'll be sending Vorinclex after your favorite PCs. <laughs> bye bye now, folks. See you next time.